Tonight we would like to discuss mainly the concept of prophethood, but from a very different angle. It's very, very important. Because as we all know, Nubuvat or prophethood forms a part of our Usul al-Din, the fundamentals of our religion on which all sects in Islam are united. Sunnah or Shia believe that there are three parts in the fundamentals, the unity and absolute unity of God, the prophethood and the day of judgment or the day of reckoning. But the singular and particular property of Islam as far as prophethood is concerned must also be recognized. It's very important because when we talk to non-Muslims, we have got to impress upon them this fact that in Islam, the concept of prophethood has a sort of a continuity. Continuity rather from Hazrat Adam up to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we talk to our non-Muslim friends, especially when I was, I remember in Nairobi, and I had an opportunity of going to a university where a Jewish friend was talking on Islam and many other religions, I brought to his attention this particular fact that we believe in that continuity of prophet. That means the prophets preceding our prophet, like Jesus, And Moses, that is the Musa salam, those who have been mentioned in Bible as well as in Quran, we believe that there has been a continuity and all the prophets preceding our prophet were sent by God. And therefore, it is a fact that if a Muslim rises up to say that I do not believe in Isa, that is Jesus, or I do not believe in Musa, that is Moses, then that man is not a Muslim. He's a kafir, he's a disbeliever. He has got to believe in all the prophets. Now this is an important thing, that there is a continuity, and together with that continuity, there is also <coughs> one singular message. And the message is that there is no God but God. La ilaha illallah. We believe that no prophet from God ever came to preach polytheism or to preach shirk or to preach more than one God. It has constantly been only one message and one preaching. Believe in one. So we believe that Jesus was the prophet of God. And Moses was prophet of God. We believe in that. But the message brought by all of them was of unity and absolute unity of God. And there isn't any room for any other deities or for Godhead in that. This having been understood, the time has come to understand that we also believe that Muhammad is the last of the prophets. And there comes the idea of the finality of the prophet. Now, before I go further to explain, I would like you to understand who a prophet is. Sometimes it is just described, a prophet is a good man. It's so simple to say that a prophet is a good man, a man of some impeccable conduct, some good nature, some very good manners, and he's a prophet. It's not like that. Or we say that the prophet is just like us. Because Quran says, Qul innama ana basharum mithlukum. O prophet, tell them that I am but a human person like you. They forget the other half of it, where say, you ha I receive revelation. That is a distinctive feature which people try to forget. 
Now, here I would like to discuss certain aspects of our existence, our lives, which might be a bit difficult to comprehend, but it is definitely very interesting. We are, as we know, this body, the ligaments and limbs that we have, we are this, plus something else, plus our ruh or soul or we would say spirit. We are two things put together. And I always say this, that we are spirit plus body. And, but who is that who says we are? That is the nafs. That is the self. A human person, a human self is soul, spirit or body. But it cannot be one of these two. Because when the soul or spirit has departed, the body that lies there dead it does not represent us. On the contrary, we say it now must be buried so that it does not decay while we are still living around. In our lives, we were told in the beginning of 18th and 19th centuries, especially after the Renaissance or the age of enlightenment, that whatever pleases your body, whatever serves your body, whatever can be understood and grasped by your body, that was the final thing on earth. The rest was all conjecture. The rest was all speculation. From England, we used to receive literature in East Africa on rationalism, which used to preach upon our minds that you believe only in those things which you can sense by your five senses. You can touch, you can see, you can hear, you can taste, and so on, you can smell. But if it goes beyond the five senses, you just don't believe it. Everything else was conjecture, speculation, guesswork. This is what we were told. Naturally, it came from England, one, it came in English, two. Even today, we have that sort of impression that anything that is spoken in English or written in English is revelation. The rest of all is trash. But this is not true. The fact is that we have a lot of trash even in English language. But what I would like to drive home is that gradually, those rationalists themselves came to believe that there was something extraordinary. There was something more than those five senses. And then we started receiving leaflets from England telling us that there is a sixth sense. And the training was given by correspondence course that there is a sixth sense. There is a sense which cannot be explained which has got nothing to do with physical world, world, it is a metaphysical world. Suddenly we found magazines coming from England talking about haunted houses. We used to know about haunted houses in Lamu and Zanzibar only. <laughs> At the most in Mombasa. So much so that people used to even joke and say these jinnat only live at the coast. Perhaps the people of Mombasa like them, or perhaps people of Lamu are like them. Whatever be the case, but why these jinnat are not seen in Kampala, for example, or not in Jinja or in any, anywhere else? But gradually we started receiving from here papers talking about houses which are haunted. And after having come to England, I know, of certain friends of mine who wanted to buy some country houses, and they were actually dissuaded from buying the house because the, the, the estate agent warned him in advance that this house is quite cheap, but it is said that it is haunted. So if you, if you are capable of living with the, with the ghosts, you might as well buy it. It was a cheap buy. But nobody would dare enter because there is a ghost. The ghost cannot be seen. It can be seen only at times. 
but now they have started believing. The steps can be heard at night. The taps open automatically. The shower runs without anybody seeing, and so on. And of course, so many things. The fact is, keeping all the superstitions aside, the fact is that there is a world beyond the five senses. Allama Iqbal said, Sitaron ke aage jahan aur bhi hai. Beyond the stars, there is another world. I mean, this they don't want to believe, but it is a fact. But how will you get into it? This. Remember, my friends, we, including myself, we are so busy with materialism. Since morning till night now that we'll go to sleep, we will be talking of nothing but material things and material values. That spiritual aspect of our own existence is now forgotten. That there is a spiritual aspect which can grow the same way as my body grows. The same way. A small child grows into adulthood and from then into old age and then dies. The same way there is a growth chart for your spirit, for root. We have forgotten that altogether. But the condition is that the spirit grows only if you reduce your contact with materialism. This is what they have not for yet understood. When we were told to fast in the month of Ramadan, people came with stories to say that doctors say that if you fast, you will live longer. It is a medicine to many diseases. It's, it may be so. But you can see how our mind is working. We are trying to find physical benefits out of fasting. Actually, fasting, apart from that, has got a spiritual benefit. It is teaching us how to reduce our connections with that which is material, like food and all that. Getting used to that which is spiritual, something like hunger, so that you may allow your spirit to develop. But unfortunately, we haven't understood that there's a spiritual aspect to fasting. What happens is the moment we break the fast, we eat twice as much as we have been deprived. And by the end, inshallah, when the month of Shawwal sets in and there is an Eid day, we have gained five or ten pounds. <laughs> and while all of us lament, oh, Ramzan na mayna maksoon, oh, oh, raunak, that raunak is only true. There was no other raunak for which we lament. That was the evening time when we enjoy breaking the fast. Some of us in our hearts of hearts thank Allah for the month to have passed, although we don't say so. We say, mashallah, now we will we'll meet next year. But we are thankful to Allah that Eid has come. This is the reason why we haven't understood. While the Prophet said to fast on every Monday and Thursday, Mustahab, not wajib, not wajib, sunnah, or not obligatory, optional. Fast on every Monday and Thursday. We thought, uh, why should one fast? The idea is to be able to cultivate that spiritualism. As long as one is attached to material, with the spirit there can be no attachment. The moment we cut off gradually from materialism, you will find yourselves that your spirit grows. Then comes a time from your old daily experience. Then comes a time suddenly that you dream and the dream comes true. The dreams of premonitions, the dreams of predictions, the dreams of giving you some of the news which you otherwise would not get comes unto you because of your <coughs> spiritual To be able to say something which will happen next. How many times most of you rise up in the morning and feel there is going to be some sad news today 
and you get the said news. How many times when we are conversing and talking to each other, both of us utter the same word at the same time. And then we say, I was going to tell you the same thing. How many times there is telepathic effect on each other? How many times I sitting here would feel that some close relative in Africa or in America is not well without telephone, without even a letter? All this happens and suddenly you get a particular talent of even healing and curing others. That means without any medicine, without any medication, you just keep your hand on him and he is cured. <coughs> this is <coughs> something which is called a spiritual development in human mind. Now, if this is understood and valued, then and then you can understand what is the meaning of Ruhaniyat. And all of us know this very well. We don't want to admit it. But the moment there is a problem, we go to whatever materially can be done. And then we are always searching for someone who will also attend spiritually. Is it not so? Why? When you go to a, an alim or a mujtahid or anyone who is a muttaqi or has God and ask him, and ask him, <coughs> then I want you to read dua for me. A dua. I want you to pray for me. I want you to come to see this sick person and pray for him. Why do you call that particular person? Why you can't pray yourselves? You can. But we take that man because there is some difference. The difference is that there is some spiritual accomplishment there. And here we are lacking in that. We take him for his piety and taqwa and nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There comes a time when that man starts getting intuitive knowledge, intuition, meaning that the knowledge which is not attained or acquired, at the same time it is the truth which he cannot even explain. This is in Islam called Ilham. Ilham is intuitive knowledge where a person knows by intuition a truth which he cannot explain how he came to know. This is happening in all human beings provided we are spiritually inclined. But when the spiritual inclination rises than that, higher than that, then you receive wahi and not ilham. Wahi is not a joke. Revelation is not a joke. You don't receive a revelation. People may make all sorts of claims and pretensions, but that doesn't come. It comes with spiritual attainment. After the degree of ilham and intuition, you come to a degree where you receive message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is called revelation. The Prophet demonstrated this for 40 years, right from his childhood till his youth and adulthood. And his visit to Ghare Hira, where he used to sit and ponder and meditate was a demonstration of how a human person can gradually progress. I'm not talking that the Nabuwat was given to him because of that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying he showed us the way. He showed us the way. Our people have taken this as the only quality of the Prophet, that to go to Ghara Hira. He showed us the way that even we can achieve something, if not revelation. But we have to learn how to cut off. We are like spiders, my dear friends. It is very difficult for a spider to cut off the web which it has spun itself around it. It's very difficult. A spider cannot cut off that, that web which it has spun itself. We have also a spun web around us and to be able to cut that 
and then get free is something else, my dear. This is something deep to ponder over. Nubuwat does not come this way. The Nabi Khadiyatul Kubra says, I used to go there in the whole of month of Ramadan. For iftar, I would keep the food and come back. I would not even ask my husband when he would return home. Because I saw him all the time in deep meditation and pondering and in his prayers. And when he came back, he said, Khadija, in order to be able to understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one has got to severe the relationship with that which is useless and materialistic and mundane. This is the meaning of prophethood. It is not a thing that we are just one, where Allah says, Tell them that I'm a person or man, human being like you, but I receive revelation. From there, the distinction starts. It is because of this that we believe that all the prophets received revelation. They were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our prophet has profusely praised Janab Isa, Jesus. Quran has also profusely praised Jesus and Moses for their piety and for their simplicity and for having severed their relationship with materialism. Our Prophet said, be like Jesus. He said, be like Jesus, my brother, who used to sleep on stone and sometimes on dust, who never married, and who never lost his temper, gave away his life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for his creation. Be like him and do not be like those who can put the whole fist, fist into ocean to collect water and come out with nothing. Have you tried? Just put your whole fist into ocean with that much abundance of water. Put your fist into it and see how much you can carry. From your fingers, everything will drop out. So we are like that. We are at the ocean. We are trying to collect all the water which is there. But when we lift our fist off that water, there isn't anything except wetness and some moisture. And that also will evaporate. Don't be like those. Now, we can't understand this, but we do understand once in a lifetime. When somebody gives us a shock, somebody dies. In Gujarati, this is called Smashan Vairagya. Smashan Vairagya. We don't go to Smashan, but Smashan means Kabrastan, let us say. Cemetery or crematorium. Smashan Vairagya means when somebody dies in my family and gives me a shock, unforeseen, immediately I say, this world is useless. Huh? What happened till yesterday? It was useful? No. It is a rude awakening. Oh, all is useless. I am shocked out of my wits and suddenly for three, four days I come for namaz. For five, six days. If it is the month of Ramadan, I will start fasting immediately. Or if Hajj is approaching for that year, I will go to Hajj. But that is only for a few days. This is called Smashan Vairagya. Piety as long as I am in the crematorium or in the cemetery. But the moment I am out of cemetery, the world again engulfs me and I forget. Ghazali has given another example. Ghazali says, have you seen? Sometimes a lion or a tiger or a cheetah jumps into the pen of sheep and cattle, small cattle, just to hunt for one small goat or one small sheep. What happens? It just pounces upon one animal and with one paw only, it jumps back out of the pen. But the others are all startled, shocked. One of them has gone. But he, they stop grazing grass for a few minutes. They look like this, animals. Nobody grazes now because they're all shocked. One has gone. But that is only for two minutes. The third minute, they're all busy grazing and forgotten everything. The same thing happens to us. So the shock is temporary, but that shock which is given to us, the treatment which nature gives us, is a shock which brings us 
from materialism, empty materialism, to something which is fulfilling, that is spiritual. Business loss. Shock. Insults, maybe. A shock. Some calamity which befalls. Allah may save us all from it. Man is shocked. When there's a shock treatment given, then a man rises and suddenly he finds himself awake. If he can keep himself awake for good time, and if the inspiration is given time to become perpetual, then he's awake all the time. But if he makes that awakening temporary, then he forgets. Because time heals the wound and everything is forgotten. So Imam Ali alayhi salam said, <laughs> Annasu niyamun idha matun tabahu. People are fast asleep. They rise when they die. They wake up when they die. We see otherwise. We see we are far wide awake. We will sleep when we will die. Amir Umin says it is the other way around. You are asleep. You will be awake when you, when you die. What is the meaning? The meaning is this, that you can be conscious of your actual power in your mind and spirit if you start this connection and this association with everything that is material. It doesn't mean that you renounce the world. It doesn't mean that you become a sadhu. It doesn't become, mean that you become a hermit. What it means, my friends, is that we actually change our emphasis. And I'm sorry that I may be repeating this, but I say this again and again. Uh, listen to a small piece of conversation going on anywhere in the society. You will not find anything useful. It's either sports, it's either business, huh? or it's either family matters, or ribat, bohtan, tohmat, accusations, allegations. Sample it. Five people here, two people there, six people there. Just go and listen. I don't say cultivate the habit of eavesdropping. But I'm just telling you that just for the sake of sampling, see what does human society do with the gift of speech? Who scored how many runs? Which was the maiden over? Who was the best batsman or cricketer in this particular? How much they earn this morning? What is your taking per week? Huh? What is your salary? And the rest I can't even talk from member. And start talking about this that I'm talking now here, or something which is really useful for my and your existence, you find people sleeping immediately. I sleeping by double E or even I double P. See, that means they either slip away from you or they sleep. They don't want to listen to those things because it just doesn't appeal. Well, the fact is that our true existence lies there. And this is the meaning of Nubuva when it goes to that climax. And that is why our belief is that Nubuva is a grace. Nubuwat is a lutf from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is an institution which he made so that our contact with him, which cannot be direct, is cultivated and created through the Prophet. Who is a light, who receives from there and transmits to us. This is the meaning of the Prophet. In Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is Khatamun Nabiyyin. Ma kana Muhammadun Aba Ahadim min Rijalikum, Walakir Rasulullah, wa Khataman Nabiyyin. Muhammad is not father of any of you, your young man. Why it is this? Because Zaid bin Haritha was with the Prophet. Actually, he came as a slave to Janab Khadija. The Prophet said, give it to me. Then Abu Khadija handed it over to him. 
Zaid came into the possession of the Prophet. The Prophet said, I don't keep slaves. So immediately he was freed. Zaid bin Haritha was freed immediately by the Prophet. The moment he was freed, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I would like to live with you as your son. Remember in the history, Zaid is a second Muslim. The first Muslim, Zahiran, that means ostensibly, the one who announced his faith was Imam Ali alayhi salam. And the second one immediately was Zaid bin Haritha. Zaid said that I also believe and I say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Now this man, his parents came from far and wide to look, up, look out for this young boy and they found him in the household of the Prophet. So they came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, this is our son. He was taken away, abducted as a slave. The Prophet said, fine, he is no more a slave. He is just living with me. I have freed him. Take him away. So father came to Zaid and said, Zaid, let's go home, your mother and I have come to collect you. And Zaid said, father, if you do not mind, let me live with Muhammad, for he is the noblest person I have seen on earth. But with your pleasure. So the father and mother lived in Medina for two, three days, five days, six days in Mecca. And they found that the Prophet was, of course, very kind and treated him so humanely. And they said, we go away and we leave you in the custody of the Prophet. Now people knew him as the son of the Prophet. What we say, foster child. That takputra. When Zainab bin Tijahash, the cousin of the Prophet, grew up to become of marriageable age, as she was one of the most beautiful women or girls of Arabia at that time, the Prophet sent a message to say that I would like Zaid to marry you. She and her relatives thought that the message which was coming was for the Prophet himself. But when the message actually came, it was in the name of Zaid, they were all displeased. And they were really displeased and they said, Oh Muhammad, do you want us to marry our girl to a free slave, freed slave? And the Prophet said, Islam has once for all abolished all the distinction al mu'min kufwul mu'min wal muslim kufwul muslim a muslim is a compatible match for a muslim and a mu'min is a compatible match for a mu'min there are no classes so zainab bin tajah said if this is your command then i agree so there was a marriage between zaid and zainab bin tajah but Zainab did not live happily with Zaid because from the very beginning there was something in the mind that this is a slave but the Prophet has given an order and of course we believe in the Prophet she lived but she was not happy nor was Zaid and Zaid used to come every time to the Prophet and say Ya Rasulullah Zainab is not cooperative in life Zainab is not helpful at home Zainab is really very a difficult woman to live with and things like that Finally, he insisted that he wanted divorce, and the divorce was performed after both of them wanted to be divorced from each other. After the divorce, the problem of the society at that time, nobody wants to study. It is exactly like the one we have today. How many divorcees we have in society whose remarriage is very remote? Who is thinking on these lines? We have young, young girls. For one reason or the other, they have been divorced. And no one is thinking whether there ever will be a remarriage for those. There may be young widows. There may be young divorces. We are just oblivious to the problems because we are busy with other things. But society having all these worries in it must be treated and must be remedied. The Prophet said, fine, Zainab, that now that you have been divorced, I will marry you. And he married. Among the wives of the Prophet is Zainab bintu Jahsh. 
immediately as he married her, the Arabs started saying, look at this Muhammad, he married his son's ex-wife. You can't marry your son's ex-wife. This was against all the customs at that time. Of course, it is against Sharia also. But the Prophet said, your foster child is not your real son. Even today, we have been told this. We don't follow it. It's our culture. It's something else. But if I have been brought up by Mr. X, I don't belong to him. I can't inherit him. He cannot inherit me because that is only fostering. <coughs> it's not real. Quran says, oh, Muhammad, we ask you to marry Zainab so that this false tradition is broken once and for all. A foster child is not a real child. A foster son or a daughter is not real. They don't inherit mutually at all. Why? So ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim min rijalikum. Muhammad is not the father of any of you. Walakin Rasulullah, he is the messenger of God. Wa khatamun nabikin, he is the final prophet. No, not. The Qadianis and the Ahmadiyas have come with something new. They say Khatam means a seal. It doesn't mean the last. Khatam means seal and not the last. And a seal can be at the end of the paper. It can also be at the top of the paper. But they forget one thing. Whether it is at the top or at the end. Once sealed, nothing can be added. And if you add anything, it will be again resealed. Because if you make a codicil on your will, if you have already sealed once and make a codicil again, you have to seal it all over again. Otherwise, that seal becomes redundant. There has been no two seals. There is only one seal. Whether you take it as a seal or you take it as the final, he is the final prophet, no prophet after. Why? There is a reason. We believe that after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the sharia that he brought, there isn't any need of any further sharia. And the changes which we see in the world, maybe technological changes, maybe changes in the technology, maybe changes in the uses of things. We believe that two things have not changed. The inherent human nature does not change. And the need of acknowledging one God and no more does not change. As long as Tawheed remains the order of the day and human nature is the same, irrespective of cultural barriers in between, Islam has got an answer. For one who can travel by aircraft or by missiles or even by rockets, it has got nothing to do with your religion. You may have all sorts of technological differences. Those things are different. What we treat is human being and not airplanes. It is for this reason that Islam is a complete way of life. I invite all Muslims and also non-Muslim friends, one day to come and see that complete code of conduct. It is not empty word. See laws pertaining to every aspect of human life. Every aspect. More elaborate, detailed. It can tell you and direct you and guide you in every way. Come and see this. It has got laws of worship. It has got laws of business. It has got laws of transactions. It has got personal law. Come and see that. And study it. And just don't say, oh, Islamic laws are medieval and therefore barbaric. Come and study it. Don't see what is done in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. Yesterday there are two Americans who became Muslims in Pakistan and they stole. I don't know. They stole because they became Muslims. I don't know. But they stole. 
after having stolen they were taken to court after having taken to court they were sentenced to the chopping of of right hand and left foot the whole world today believes that this is islamic punishment while the fact is that it is not islamic punishment it's nowhere in islam it's a challenge to all the muslims to find out where not even in ahlus sunnah leave aside the shayyu or shia not even in ahlus sunnah in these both two schools of thought there isn't this punishment that you cut the right hand and the left foot it isn't there but the media islamic media together has written this and today a young man when he goes in the bazaar and if he finds a non muslim friend he asks him he says but do muslims have barbaric laws like this what happened the man has a stolen and he want to chop off his right hand and left foot who will tell that young non muslim friend of ours that there are 16 laws controlling theft before you can cut you on the finger 16 masail 16 inhibitions 16 laws precluding the possibilities of chopping even the finger when those 16 have been crossed and passed then you come to a circumstance where you will not chop off the palm or hand or anything you will chop off the finger that is because islam believes in prevention but not so easily as you see that certain governments do it the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought that law and we muslims should understand what is the meaning of prophethood and what a spiritual aspect it has when we discuss with our friends from other religions we request them one thing do not view the life of prophet of islam from an angle of a critic we don't view the life of jesus as critics we see the life of jesus from spiritual angle also because we believe him to be a prophet and spiritually we study the life of moses because we believe him to be the prophet and the same way we study the life of abraham because we believe him to be the prof and the same way we study yusuf and yaqub and all that it is therefore fair for muslims to expect that you will also one day uh, cultivate a habit of looking at the life of muhammad spiritually you know what is the difference then they will not come with telling us oh muhammad was a sensuous person he married nine wives for everything that muhammad did there is a joke washington irving alfred gilom and many other writers so much so that dante in his inferno has included muhammad as one of the imposters and has shown him in hell dante is supposed to be one of the literary figures you cannot study muhammad that way you have got to understand that he was a prophet and therefore there is a spiritual aspect to it but whatever he did he did with a purpose he was sent for a purpose and that is the reason why human beings in this world are not fools the most acknowledged and acceptable leader uh, today on earth irrespective of the cultural changes and differences we have is muhammad mustafa sallallahu alaihi wa sallam for his message appeals and his message is such that it really applies to human lives provided it is taken in spirit wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh